All right, guys, we're just going to get started if all that buzzing and stuff is like that. Stop now. All right, just make sure you're in the right room. This is what we're going to be talking about for the next 45 minutes. So the overview of a European Space Agency data science project. Um, this is me. A uh, quick introduction. Um, this is probably two important parts uh, there. This is what I actually do, freelance data scientist. Let me just unpack that. Um, a little bit for you. Um, freelance, that's pretty easy to understand. I'm available for hire for anybody who thinks that they require data science inside their organization. So that's pretty straightforward. The data science, that's a little bit more complicated because saying you're a data scientist is a bit like saying you're a painter. Well, do you do portraits or do you do garden fences? Okay, so it's a bit like that for data science. It covers a broad church. But this is what I do here. I do predictive analytics, machine learning, machine vision, and computational linguistics. Uh, We'll be doing predictive analytics and machine learning. You will see a bit of that today. You will see some machine vision. Uh, you won't see any computational linguistics. Computational linguistics is pretty much the same as machine vision, but it's like machine reading. Um, what happens is, whereas in machine, in machine vision, when you show the, an image to, to an algorithm, the algorithm works out what's in that image or does some kind of processing with that image, Computational linguistics is pretty much the same for the written word. You show the computer a bit of text and it works out the meaning of the text. We're not going to do any of that today. The other important stuff down here is on the bottom. Okay, this is where to get a hold of me if you've got any questions about the session once uh, you leave. So with that, let's crack on. So what problem are we trying to solve? Uh, basically, people. All right, there's a lot of people on the planet and it turns out that we like to generate more people. Who knew? Okay, so on top of that, actually the people, to be fair, the people are not really the problem, okay? The problem is that they all want to eat stuff. Um, they all want to be fed and they all want to live places. And surprisingly, not, it surprised me, but when you think about it, it's not really surprising. They turn out that they want to live in what is the best places to actually grow food. Because the best places to grow food are the places which have a nice balance of, you know, nice sunshine and, and not, so not too much sunshine so it's too hot, not too much rain so it's too cold um, and horrible. That's the best places for growing crops. It's also where people like to live. So at a time when the population is growing and we're, we're needing more food as well as that, um, economies which are, are growing and moving from being poor economies to richer economies, so places like China and India, the middle classes in those countries are starting to develop a taste for meat, particularly chicken and pork. All right, Now, that's, that exacerbates the problem because it takes more land mass to actually grow a pig than it does actually to grow corn for, f for feeding us. Okay, So it takes more land to actually grow um, pork and stuff like that, and that is becoming more and more popular. And then on top of that... And we have issues with climate change, which means more and more of the planet's surface is becoming less hospitable for actually growing crops because it's either far too hot and arid to grow anything or it floods every five or ten minutes. Okay, so we have all of these problems, which um, are, is probably going to lead in the not too distant future to food shortages throughout the world. And this is a problem that we are trying to solve. Okay. So part of the solution, it, the solution is a complex problem, so obviously the solution is going to be complex, but part of it is definitely going to be maximizing crop yields. And this is a, a subsection of that problem we're going to be looking at today. So to this end, the European Space Agency wanted to, the answers to three questions. Can we monitor crop health from space? Can we count crops from space? And can we identify and quantify weeds in cereal crops from space? Do you see a theme here? Okay, like from space. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, can we actually monitor crop health from space? Well, to talk about that, first of all, we need to know what we need to know how we're going to do that, and we need to know what we actually mean by crop health. So the first thing, this is what we were talking about before machine vision. So we're gonna do this by machine vision. We do we capture this image by satellite. Here it is here. This is the Landsat satellite satellite. Um, two things to note about this image before we move on. Firstly, it doesn't really do that, right? It doesn't shine a big light over the earth as it moves, right? That would be a bit scary, okay? Secondly, I love this, the solar panel array. Four nice, so clearly this satellite requires four satellite panels worth of power to be able to run. And the guy who designed it said, I could put 
two on this side and two on that side and it'll be nice and balanced. But no, I'm going to torture the engineers who have to build this thing and I'm going to put them all on this side. So the engineers come today every day at work. They're going to look at that thing and go, man, that's fugly. If only there was two on the other side. <laughs> See, designers are horrible. All right, so that's how we're going to capture our image. So this is how we're going to do the from space part. Okay, so machine vision tends to come in two main flavors. Okay. Stuff that we can see as a human, so, so images, for example, we could take a picture with our camera, we could give it to an algorithm, the algorithm can see the image, and we can see that same image as well. And two invisible images, so the, the satellite has an advantage. It can see in wavelengths that we can't see in, and that would be an invisible image. So we're going to provide the, the algorithm with an image that we couldn't actually see anyway and then ask it to tell us something about that image okay and for this first part we're going to be dealing with invisible or images which wouldn't be visible to us so that's how we're going to capture it part let's talk about this crop health part and in fact um ndvi as we call it here so let's have a look at that so what is ndvi so ndvi is the normalized difference vegetation index you can see why we just call it ndvi now can you but what is it? So, for those of you who, who can't quite remember your schoolboy and schoolgirl um, biology, <coughs> plants strongly reflect visible light in that wavelength here. Or for those of you who don't have a, uh, a memory for um, wavelengths, we call that green. Okay? And they strong, strongly absorb light in this wavelength. For those of you who don't know what that is, that is the near infrared. And those two wavelengths and, and that ability to absorb one almost completely and reflect another or almost completely, we can use that to calculate this NDVI. So NDVI is actually calculated like this. It's, um, as, as it says at the top, it's a, it's a normalized difference. So we take the near infrared and we subtract the visible light and then we divide that by the near infrared plus the visible light. And what that gives us is a number that falls in the range between minus 1 and positive 1. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, minus 1 means there is no vegetation there absolute there's there's no vegetation there whatsoever. Okay, so it's complete desolation. So that's places like the middle of the desert, the middle of the Arctic, the middle of Warsaw, you know, places places like that. <laughs> Always play to your audience. <laughs> Positive one means there is strong vegetation. So that's like the middle of the Amazonian rainforest, someplace like that, where you look down and it's pretty much all plant. Okay? So we can calculate this pretty easy. Here's some code to do this. What we do is we will get, um, from the satellite, we'll get um, a latitude and a longitude and a bunch of wavelengths. Actually, I think there's something like nine wavelengths it measures. We're only interested in those two. Okay, so we can ignore the rest. And what we do is from those bunch of readings, we can take in, and for each reading in the reading, we can take the latitude and the longitude. We can do that calculation to create the NDVI, and we can return um, that index there, that um, list of indexes there, which now gives us a bunch of latitude and longitudes and the NDVI. So we can then look down. So what we've got there is a satellite image that says for this particular latitude and longitude, and we probably measure it in something like 30 meter squares, we can say for this latitude and this longitude, we have this NDVI. Okay, well that's a start. Okay, that's a start. But that doesn't give us the whole story. Okay, that doesn't really tell us anything about crop health. That just basically gives us a measure of biomass. Okay, we need to do more than that because it's a bit more complicated. Here is a satellite image of um, an arable land. Actually, this is in the in the U.S. Two things struck me the very first time I saw this image. Right, one is there's very, it's very patchwork. There's areas there of absolute dark, dark green, and there's patches there which are almost appear to be white. Okay, and it's all vegetation. Okay, so just being able to say, well, the biomass is this and the biomass is that, doesn't tell us what is healthy or not, because obviously there's a variety of crops there, okay? And the other thing that struck me with this is, how many circular patches there are on that? What, what is with that? Why do they grow crops in circles, right? So if anybody knows, you can tell me. If anybody's watching this video afterwards and you happen to farm in North America, please email me and tell me why you've got so many circular fields. It's the sheep watering. It's the sheep, sheep are tied. 
they're tied and they walk around in circles. <laughs> it's, it's, I prefer that. I prefer aliens. <laughs> All right. I mean, it could be. It could totally be the sheep stick to the ground walking around in circles, but I prefer aliens. Okay. But then if it flattened, so what the gentleman's saying there is it's the water spout that goes round in a circle. But if that flattens the crop to make that circular pattern, that's, that's not going to help. It just makes it round. Yeah, and that makes the crop circular. There you go. See, every day's a school day. That answers that question. Right, so... We need to know more than just the biomass, okay? So we need something more. So what we need to do is we need to recruit, to be able to answer this question, okay, we need to recruit a lot of citizens, citizen farmers, to do citizen science, okay? And what, what we need to give them is uh, an NDVI detector on the front of their tractors or, what, or whatever, or just a handheld one. And what we need them to do is to go into the field and we need them to tell us the latitude and longitudes, so we know where about on the planet they are, or where about the UK, where about in Europe they are. Okay? We need them to tell us the, the time of day, the month of the year, what crop they're actually growing, and what growth phase they're actually in. And from this, and obviously what the NDVI index is as, as well, and from that we'll be able to tell what crop at what part of the growth cycle it's in, and at what um, time of that growth cycle and in what part of the planet what what it should actually be okay so we need citizen farmers to actually measure and tell us what crops how what the actual biomass reading is for healthy crops at the different stages okay so we need that part as well does anybody know why we why we would ask them to record the time of day and month of the year as well because of the light, exactly. So different times of the year, different times of the day, the Earth will be at a different place on its axis when the, when the satellite goes over. And that will affect how the light is reflected through the atmosphere. And we need to control for that when we're measuring those two things. So we need to know that as well. Okay? Okay, and with that, with that sort of background knowledge of what the biomass measurements for different crops at different places on the planet, at different times, at different parts of their growth cycle actually are, then, when the satellite comes over and tells us what reading it's got, we can actually do a, a thing called um, log linear regression. Let's have a quick look at that. So what we can do is, we can step into R here, and what we can do is, we can basically, this is just, it's, yes. Oh, that is pretty horrible. Uh, I don't know, can I? Um, tools. Global options. Global options. Uh, appearance. Uh, that's not going to be any good. Give me a white one. There we go. That's a nice feedback noise. All right. That's better. Okay. So basically, as he falls off the stage, this is the, this is the line we're interested in here. Okay, actually, instead of pointing at it, I shall uh, just highlight it like this. This is the line we're interested in here. And basically what we're saying here is, Dear R, I want to use your generalized linear model. Okay, and what I want to do is, so the first part says, I want to calculate NDVI, and then there's a little tilde, which basically can be read as, as a function of, and then whatever part of that citizen science captured data we think we want to use. This is just an example, so I think I'm just using two parts. I think I'm using the time of day and the month of the year, two things which are absolutely not going to be able to, um, to, um, to calculate that for us. And then we say, I want to use the data that I've just read in, in the line above, and the family of the linear model that I want you to use is the binomial family, because <coughs> we, want to, we want to predict a variable with between, we know it's going to be between 0 and 1, okay? So we're going to use the log linear regression because we know we're going to have some kind of biomass and we want to predict what it is between 0 and 1. So what we can do is we can run this code now, like so, and that's going to calculate a whole bunch of, if you look right down at the bottom, that's going to, that is going to calculate a bunch of um, coefficients for us. So the y-intercept and the coefficient for this um, variable and the coefficient for this variable. 
And once we've got those coefficients, if we jump back to the slide, once we've got those coefficients, then what we can do is we can use this lovely little formula here, okay, which kind of looks horrible when you see it um, the first time, but actually this part is just the linear regression. So that's the y-intercept plus the, co um, the coefficient for each of the variables that you're looking for. So this would be time of day, for example, or day of or month or one of the other ones that we've captured. That's the coefficient we've got. That's the y-intercept. Okay, so that's pretty much linear regression. It's the, it's the formula of a straight line we all remember from school. The rest of it, where we're raising it to the, to the base of the natural logarithm and the 1 over 1 plus, just constrains that value between 0 and 1 for us. Okay, so that's going to give us some kind of value between 0 and 1. And once we've got that, we can say, well, based on the historical information that we know, we predict that if you are growing barley in late September in the northeast of um, Scotland, then we know that you should have a biomass measurement of this, okay? And the satellite will come over, and it will take the value, and I'll say, well, actually, the measured value is actually this. And you can compare that to what your predicted value is. And it's with, if it's out with a particular threshold, then you can raise an alert to the farmer and say, you should go and have a look at this, okay? And the reason that that is important is because using this method, we can detect um, changes in the plants, which means that it's not thriving, seven to ten days before you could actually, the, before the farmer who's walking the field can actually see the plant starting to deteriorate in the field. So that's seven to, days, seven to ten days of warning that he wouldn't get otherwise. And in that seven to ten days, he can sample the soil and have that sent away to an agronomist, and the agronomist will actually tell him, well, the crop's not thriving because there's too much pH in the soil, or there's not enough, or there's this problem, or there's that problem. And that gives the farmer time to fix it. And if he fixes it within that seven to ten day window where the plant isn't actually showing any outward signs of failing yet, then the yield will be pretty much the same as if that plant was thriving throughout its growth phase. Okay, so it is very important for that, um, for that purpose. The reason we send alert to the farmer to say you should go and look is because it doesn't necessarily, just because the, the biomass measurement is way off, doesn't mean to say there's actually any problems. And that is because farmers are a pain in the ass. Okay? One of the things that they love to do is to leave tractors in a field because they know they're going to use that tractor in that field tomorrow. So there's no point in driving it all the way back to the farm in traffic and it only to drive it back to the field again the next day. So they'll leave it in the field. And then the satellite will come winging over and it will take a picture and we will take the um, biomass index for that particular part of the field and it'll come back as you know something like zero or or negative one or whatever, and we'll raise that as a problem to the farmer, and we'll go, no, that's not a problem because that's a tractor, okay? Or sheds, they'll build sheds at, at the end of the fields and stuff like that. So we have to tell them, we're not actually saying that there's anything wrong, because there might not be, we're actually going to say, look, this is not what we expected it to be, you should probably go have a look at that. Okay, so the next thing is, can we count crops from space? Okay, so in the same way, now we're dealing with visible light, so the um, satellite will come over and it'll take a picture and it'll be the same kind of picture as we can see, okay? So let's have a quick demonstration of how we do that. If we jump in here to this absolutely awesome demonstration project which I have created, if any of you nice people out there are um, UI or UX designers, okay, I shall apologize now, all right? Yeah, <laughs> you laugh, you haven't seen my front end yet. <laughs> That's what she said. Okay, so... <coughs> Let's, let's load this up. Uh, that's the wrong one. So let's um, grab that. Um, let's grab some look at potatoes. Let's take this one. So here we've got a, we've got a satellite image of a potato field. Let's, um, let's count those plants. I love it when it goes silent like that. Okay, there are 92 plants in this um, in this in this um, picture. If you don't believe me, you can come and count them later. All right. What I've done here is I've, um, what you can see is the picture at the top, which is all green with plants. What you can see at the bottom is it all clustered and counted. And I've colored the clusters in different colors so you can actually see them and you can match them to the plants above. That way, you know, the algorithm actually did count and cluster the plants or cluster them and then count them. And I'm not just making it up. Okay. I got it to color it for you. Obviously, it doesn't have to color it in the actual algorithm to be able to, to um, count the plants. That's just for your benefit. All right, so let's get rid of that. 
This is actually done in two steps, okay? So the first step is we classify everything. Oh, hello. We classify everything, which makes it do that. So what we're basically saying is at the minute, the image at the top, okay, we've got an image which is basically full of pixels of all different kinds of colors, okay? Some stuff we're interested in, some stuff we're not. So the first step is, is to just change it into stuff we're interested in and stuff we're not. So what we do is we go through and we say, if you reach this green threshold, and we'll look at the code in a second, but if we reach this standard of, of green, this threshold for green, I am actually interested in you, so I want to turn that pixel white. Otherwise, I'm going to turn that pixel black. And then what we do there is we've then, we've then created a binary classification of stuff we're interested in and stuff we're not interested in. Having done that, what we want to do then is cluster all the stuff that we're interested in together to form individual plants, and then we want to count those clusters. So that's the second part. So if I grab this now and cluster it, you can see I'll then cluster all these pixels into individual plants and then color them in for your benefit and count them. Okay, so that's that. Let's jump back to the slides now and see how that's done. Okay, so again, we're using two fundamental elements of machine learning, classification and clustering, as I just said. Classification, I just explained to you, is very straightforward. Clustering is a little bit more complicated because there's different ways to do it. But the way I've done it here is weighted distance, k nearest neighbor. Okay, so that's a little bit complicated, so let's unpack that. Let's start at the right-hand side because that's the easiest place to start and explain nearest neighbor. What we do with nearest neighbor is when I've got a point that I want to cluster, I say to, to people, I say to, don't say to people, I say to points who are their near neighbor, and we'll talk about that in a minute, should this point be in your group? And that neighbor gets a vote. So for example, if I'm trying to cluster people in, these, in the first three um, of this row here, if I, if I want to cluster this gentleman, I might say to you, should he be in your row? I say to you, should he be in your row? I say to you, should he be in your row? And then the guy at the back, you're just too far away, so you don't get a vote. Okay? So that's nearest neighbor. And then what I do is I count up all the votes, and the one who says should be in your row, they have the most points. So the K part is how many clusters you want all the points to be clustered into. And you have to specify that. Now, there's two ways to deal with that. One, you can say right from the start, I want you to take this entire audience, for example, or all the points in this image, and I want you to cluster it into four clusters. That's one way of doing it. Well, we can't do that because the K part of it is actually how many potato plants we've got. And if we knew that, then we wouldn't have to count them in the first place. So we have to use the second method of working out what K is, and that is to provide a heuristic, a kind of set of rules for determining how many k there should be as we go through. And I'll show you how that's done in a minute. And the last part there is weighted distance. And weighted distance just means if I'm going to ask you and you and you as to whether or not this guy should be in your row, you're obviously closer. So it's not fair, or not only is it not fair, but it wouldn't work if this guy's vote counted for the same as the guy in the second row's vote, who counted for the same as the guy in the third vote in the third row's vote. So what happens is, we say, the nearer you are to the point that we want to actually cluster, the more your vote will count. So we need some kind of linear function there to say, the further away you are, the less your vote counts. And the closer you are, the more your vote counts. And that's the weighted distance k nearest neighbor. All right, does everybody understand that? Yeah, it is it's quite straightforward. Okay. Yes. <coughs> so let's have a look at that. So what we do here then is let's have a look at, first of all, is the classification part. All right, so right up at the top, what we do is we take in the bitmap, okay, and then we, this part here, what we do is we walk every pixel in the image, okay? So we walk the pixel in the image and we say for a start, please get me the pixel at X and Y. So here actually we're, walk, we're walking the image um, all of the pixels in one column and then all of the pixels in the other column, all right? So what we do there is we walk up to each of the pixels in turn and we do this brilliant thing in C-sharp. C-sharp's an awesome language. You say, please bitmap, get me the pixel here. And it says, certainly, here's a color, all right? Everybody knew that, right? If you ask, if you say to a bitmap, get a pixel, what you get back is a color, all right? That's totally intuitive, right? So we get back this color and then we say, if this color has met this green threshold, I want you to color it white. 
otherwise color it black. And that's what we did, okay? So, how do we actually, how did we actually get this green threshold? I keep talking about this green threshold and if we've met it, all right? But how do we actually calculate it? So what we do here to calculate it is we create uh, an intensity histogram, okay? So the intensity histogram is, all we do is, again, we walk the pixels, okay? And we get the pixel at the bitmap, all right? And we actually count it. So what we do is we create an array a 256 array, so we've got zero, basically got an array, zero to 255, and then we walk the bitmap, and every time we come up with an intensity, a green intensity at that particular point in the array, we just add one to it, okay? So that creates a frequency distribution for all of the greenness in the, in the um, bitmap. And then once we've got that, then what we do is we say, um, give me all so what we have to do is skip the first one. So we say, give me all but the first one, because the first one is zero intensity, so that's stuff which is not green, right? Okay, so we can ignore that. And then what we do is, I take an average of the frequencies, okay? So find the, the average frequency, and then what I want to do is I want to find the frequency in the distribution closest to the average, all right? Because the, the frequency might not, the average frequency might not actually exist in the histogram, so I want to find the one closest to the average, so that's what this line does. And then once I've found that, um, once I've found that average frequency, I return the intensity that's at that frequency. And that intensity of green for that particular image is what we're going to say is the green threshold. Everybody, everything that we want to count has to at least meet the average um, green threshold to work. Okay, once we've done that, we can then cluster, we can then cluster the classified image. Okay, so to do that, what we want to do is we want to whoops, we want to clear any previous clusters that we've got. We want to walk through the image again. This time, when we get to the pixel, we're only interested in the white ones. And then when we say when we find a white one, we want to cluster that point. To cluster the point, what we do is first of all, if we have no clusters whatsoever, so this is the first point. There's no clusters already. Then that point is going to be the root of the first cluster. And this is part of this heuristic that I was telling you about before. We have to develop a heuristic for working out how many k we need to cluster. So that's the first part of the heuristic. If you're the very first point, you must be the very first cluster. Okay? And that's what that line here at the top does. So we add that to that cluster. Otherwise, what we want to do is we want to get the cluster for the point. And this function here, get cluster for the point, will actually return a cluster number. If it returns a cluster number, then we'll add the point to that cluster. Otherwise, if this doesn't return a cluster number, we will create a new cluster, and that point will be the first point in that new cluster. And that's the second part of the heuristic that we've got for, um, for working out how many k we need. So there's two parts to it. If you're the very first one, you go in your own cluster. And if we can't, if none of the neighbors are close enough, or the votes are all tied or whatever, then what we do is we'll create a new cluster, and that's the second part of that heuristic. Okay. To get a list of the nearest neighbors, what we want to do is we want to set some kind of threshold. So this will be this will be different for every crop, I would guess. All right, so we're going to set, or an agronomist is going to set what the threshold is. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, all of the points that I've got, give me all of the ones where the clustered point is a neighbor. And this is a neighbor is just an extension method I've added to bool, to the boolean um, type, which which basically says if the distance from me to this test point here is within the threshold that you've given me, then return true, and it is a neighbor. This distance from function I talked about is just an extension method that I've added to double, which gives you the Euclidean distance between two points. Okay, so this is pretty, pretty straightforward and simple stuff. Then what we want to do for each of them, we want to give them a vote. Okay, so ask each neighbor to vote for the point. This is what I was talking about before. So what we do here is we walk through all of those neighbors and we say we collect the votes. So we say each of those, each voting point, vote for this test point. Okay? And the voting point here is again another extension method that I've added to double, which says we're just going to use that Euclidean distance. Okay? to actually have a measure of what your vote is. So your vote is how close you are. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that 
I'm going to have one and I'm going to divide it by that distance. And that gives us the weighting. So if you were very close and say you voted 10, okay, then that would be one tenth your vote would be. If you're further away and you've, your distance is 100, your vote would be one divided by 100, which would obviously be smaller. And that, that's how your vote would count more than your vote there. And this is how we do the weighted part of the weighted distance k nearest neighbor. What we do there is, once we've collected all the votes, we simply compare the number of votes we've got now against the current high vote. And if it's more than the current high vote, that number of vote becomes the current high vote, and that cluster that that point that did the voting was in becomes the current cluster. And then if we, if we go all the way through that, the one that's left at the end will be the cluster which that point is closest to, and then that point will join that cluster. We'll return that cluster, as I said here. If we find one, we'll return it here. If not, we'll add that new cluster, and then we'll add that point to a new cluster. And that's the second part of that heuristic that we have for building up how many K we need. Okay, so that is how we count the crops, all right? That is the clustering method, classification and clustering method we use for counting crops. The third question that they want answered was, can we identify and quantify weeds inside of um, cereal crops. So in particular, there's a crop called black grass and it grows in arable um, fields like wheat and barley and things like that. Now they call it black grass and if it was actually black, that would be really helpful. But it's slightly darker green than the green of the crop. In fact, you, can, you can't really see it if you're walking in the field, all right? You have to kind of, you have to be in the air before you can see it at all, okay? So, Let's have a quick demonstration of what I mean by weed detection. Let's jump back into my superb UI, right? I bet you're all jealous. Okay, what we'll do now is grab, grab this black grass detection. What we need here is we need to um, load an image. So if we go back to here and then go into black grass, and if we say, so here's a sample of our field. Let's open that. And this field here has both crop and black grass in it, and you could probably almost see the difference in the shading there from that picture. Let me just stretch that out a bit. Okay, so it's far from being black, all right, the grass. Okay, it's a slightly different color green. So what we're going to do now is, from that picture, we'll have an agronomist take a sample of crop. So we ask it to take a sample of crop. And we'll ask an agronomist to provide us with a sample of black grass, which is this one here. And then what we'll do is we'll ask the algorithm to detect the black grass. Given those two samples, we'll ask it to detect the black grass. Bang, 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 bang. This takes a little time, hopefully not too long. There we go. And what I've done here is I've colored it black now so we can have a really good look at it. Okay. So now you can see, once it's colored black, you can see that there's an awful lot more black grass than what, app, what it looked like there was in the first place. So there's two benefits of doing this. One, from this picture now, it becomes more obvious how much black grass there actually is in the crop, whereas in the first image, it's not necessarily so obvious. But more importantly, because we've had our machine vision algorithm actually color that in, right, and we've actually colored the pixels black or we've left them alone, we know exactly how much black grass there is in there because we know what percentage of the, we know what percentage of the crop we colored black and what percentage we left um, alone. Okay, so we can work out what quantity of black grass is in, actually in that field. Also, we could just take a mouse and highlight a part of the field and say, right, okay, for this part of the field, tell me what my percentage of black grass is. Right, let's jump back to the slides. Okay, so how was this done? This was done with a machine learning, um, machine learning algorithm. Again, it's classification, and it's uh, a Bayesian classification here. So let's talk a little bit about Bayesian classification. Bayesian classification has a really simple, um, a really simple uh, equation. It looks a bit complicated, but it's actually easy once you actually know how to parse the syntax. What that says here is, and we'll we'll use the example that we're using. It says, what is the probability? of this pixel being black grass, given that, that's how you read the bar, given that this pixel is of this intensity. And we answer that question by saying, well, what's the probability of, of seeing that intensity when we know we've got black grass, multiplied by the probability of us having black grass anyway, divided by um, 
the probability of seeing that intensity in either the black grass sample or the crop sample. Okay, so it's pretty easy to read. All right, so this actual algorithm is broken down like this. This part here is called the posterior probability. Okay, and that's how probable is the event given the evidence. So how probable is it we've got black grass given that we've got a pixel of this intensity? Okay, this part is the likelihood. How probable is it that the evi of the evidence given that our hypothesis is correct, i.e. it is black grass? This part here is called the prior, okay? And the prior is, it represents um, the probability of our knowledge before the evidence. So it's basically how probable, how probable is it that we have black grass anyway? And this part here is called the marginal. And that's, well, how probable is the evidence we are seeing given that either hypothesis or both hypotheses is correct, i.e. it is black grass or it isn't black grass. So this is the algorithm that we're going to use. And we're going to do this this way. So here's the code that does it. Here's our black grass. Try again. Black grass. That's harder to say than it looks. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take, we're going to create a probability distribution from the crop um, sample and a probability um, distribution from the black grass sample. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a copy of the bitmap. We have to take a copy of the bitmap because we're going to change it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to color that bitmap, and then we're going to return it and display it. So here's the probability. Um, this is how we take, do the probability distribution. It's just exactly the same as you saw previously, where we take a, an array of two fi size 255, and then we walk our way through the sample and we get all the colors and we ask for the intensity of green and we increment a count at that particular intensity, which will be some point in this array. And that will give us this probability distribution that we can then return. And we do that for both the crop sample and the black grass sample. Having done that then, what we do is we then go in here back to this color bitmap. And inside the color bitmap function, what we do here is again, we walk through the image and what we do is, again, we get this image. We get provided the intensity of the green, i.e. it is some kind of greenness. It's not brown or a tractor or something like that. Okay, if it is some kind of green, then what we do is we, we, calculate, the, we calculate the probability that that intensity is black grass, and we pass in the intensity. And if that's over 50%, i.e. it's more likely to be black grass than not, then we color it black. Okay, and then in the end, we return that whole colored sample. Okay, now here is the function that does the actual probability. And as you can see here, it's just the Bayesian, it is just that Bayesian um, equation that we looked at before. Okay, so it's the likelihood times the prior divided by the marginal. And you can see here's the likelihood, which is just the, um, what is the likelihood of that intensity being black grass? Here's the prior. The prior represents our prior knowledge, and that's basically, well, what's our probability of getting black grass anyway before we're looking at any evidence? And then here's the marginal at the bottom, and the marginal at the bottom is, well, what's the, what is the probability of seeing that intensity regardless of whether it's black grass or whether it's, um, whether it's proper crop, okay? And we just use that calculation there, and we return that posterior probability. And if it's over 50%, we mark it as black, okay? So, that's all that I intend to talk about today. Um, if you have enjoyed this session, then please tweet about it. Okay, that's my Twitter handle. That is the hashtag. If you have not enjoyed it, I also have a Twitter account for that as well. Okay? If you disliked this quite intensely, please feel free to send me abuse at the Twitter account that I keep for abuse and haters. Um, failing that... Sorry, I'll put that back just so you can take your picture. <laughs> All right, have we done? Good. Failing that, okay, we have five minutes now for anybody who's got any questions about how this was done or why it was done or whether it's practical at all. Is it going to help? Okay, you can ask me anything about data science about this, but not who's going to win the lottery. I beg your pardon? Um, great question. So what the question there was is, is that in production? And the answer to that question is, I don't really know, is the answer to that. The, um, I don't actually know what the European Space Agency did with it. What they did was, the European Space Agency hired a precision agricultural firm, okay, to do this work. Um, the, precision the precision agriculture firm had, you know, 
all of the equipment for doing the measurements and for working out you know, the GPS positioning and all of that fixed to their tractors. They also had all of the agronomists, but what they didn't have was any data science um, capability. So they hired me to do that. So we did this work and we passed all the results on to the European, S European Space Agency who funded it and then they did whatever they want to do with it. And to be honest, I have no idea what that is. Okay. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So the question there was, you know, I take it they were just paying for the results and, you know, none of this source code is proprietary. Absolutely right. Otherwise, I wouldn't have walked you. I would have given you demonstrations, but I wouldn't have walked you through the code. Um, basically, they hired us to prove that these three things could be done. Okay. And we proved that they could be done and they went on their way rejoicing. Yes, sir. Right, so the question there was how do you deal with shadows and, and, and that sort of thing? So what we what we do is we, we deal with the we deal with the different um, tilts in the Earth's atmosphere by also recording the month of the year and the day um, as well as the crop um, as well as the crop type and where it is in its growth phase. Okay? And then we account for so we account for that kind of things. Big shadows, like if you've got a shed and it's cast a big shadow, that will actually be that will actually be black, right? And it's one of these things where it would probably it's easier instead of trying to account for that to just alert the farmer and say there's a problem with this area of your field, and we'll actually send them the picture, you know, with because we know where the where the GPS coordinates are, and we know the shape files on the field. So what we'll actually do is we send the farmer both a picture of his field and where it is on his land on, a, on the map, you know, so like a, a Google Maps or a Bing Max Maps shape file. And we say, this part of your field has a problem. And he'll go, yes, that's, he'll go, yes, that is the shadow from this shed. Please stop alerting me about this. Or yes, that's a shadow from my tractor. Um, so that's fine. Please stop alerting me about that. But in general, there aren't actually shadows in the field because there, tend not, there tends not to be buildings and things like that. Um, Say again? Clouds. Yeah, exactly. So, so clouds and stuff like that. One of the questions I've had before is, well, what happens? I mean, if you fly a satellite over the UK particularly, right? If you fly, and Scotland, if you fly a satellite over the UK, I will guarantee to you seven days out of ten what you will see is just cloud, right? You won't see the UK, okay? And the answer to that is what we do in those days is we fly UAVs under the cloud, all right? So, we, so when we actually said from space, what we actually mean is from the air. It may be satellites, it may be aircraft, it may be, it may be UAVs. Um, it depends on where, whereabout you are in the world. I mean, of course, we trialed this in the UK because that's where we are. But this is something, if, it's going to, if this is going to be part of the solution or, or stuff like this, obviously we're in the very early days. But if things like this are going to be part of the solution to increasing crop yields, we're going to do this all over the place right globally so the vast majority of where we'll be looking isn't going to have these kind of problems okay so you're talking about like the dust bowl of america where they grow this and out on the russian plains where they grow most of the world's cereals actually aren't going to have problems like this so way more than 80 percent of the of the globe that we'd be looking at won't have this problem and you're only looking at you know two to three percent where we'll have to go well actually we can't get regular photographs so we'll have to fly UAVs and even then we don't know what what regular photographs actually means you know is it enough because plants don't grow that quickly you know if we get one clear day in 15 is that going to be enough probably it'll also depend on um, what what type of plant you're growing obviously some mature faster than faster than the others so actually it's probably not going to be an issue what we probably do is look at that image and say, no, it's cloudy over this field or it's cloudy over the entirety of the UK, which some days it is. We're just going to ignore today's results, right? We'll, we'll catch it next pass round. And if we have 15 consecutive passes where we haven't been able to get a reading, then maybe we'll fly a UAV, all right? So that's basically how we deal with, with that. Okay, so I'm... So question there was... Are there, automatic, um, are there automatic algorithms? And yes. Um, so what happens is there'll be automatic stuff like the entirety of the UK is covered in cloud. Well, there's no point in going any further. We can do that. And the other way, and, the, and right all the way down to the granular level where the farmer says, stop warning me about this because that's a shed. 
that I've built there, right? So he would have to do that one time, all right? But once we know that that's going to be a permanent fixture, the farmer can tell us it's a permanent fixture and he won't warn us again. The farmer can also say, ignore it this time because that was a tractor that I parked there overnight. It won't be parked here again, right? So please feel free to tell me about that the next time, but ignore it this time. Okay, okay, we're out of time, I'm afraid. If you do have any more questions, then please um, come down and ask me as I'm packing up, right? But other than that, thanks very much for coming. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs>